Several foreign observers and delegations will monitor Saturday's presidential and national assembly elections across Nigeria. Members of the delegations include political and civic leaders, election experts and regional specialists from 20 countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America and North America. There will be a joint international election observation mission to Nigeria deployed by the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute. The observers who have been in the country for some days have passed a vote of confidence on the Independent National Electoral Commission on the level of preparation for the election. They are advising political actors to play the game by the rules. Malawi, Dr. Joyce Banda, who is leading a joint international election observation mission to Nigeria, deployed by the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute. And from our off-site studio, we have Idaya Hassan, a political analyst and the director of the Center for Democracy and Development, based in the Nigerian capital Abuja. Let's start off uh, with uh, Joyce Banda. Good to see you and thanks for your time. And uh, this is not your first time coming to Nigeria since uh, you left office in 2014. Uh, let us in on what uh, you have been able to glean so far by speaking with the everyday Nigerian as they prepare for this election. First and foremost, allow me to congratulate the people of Nigeria because this is about Nigeria and Nigerians wishing to achieve a credible, free and fair election. Uh, so to start with, I would like to say that uh, I, it was yesterday when I attended the briefing by the chair of the INEC, uh, the Electoral Commission. And uh, after that briefing, we had an opportunity to have a, a small meeting with him, with his commissioners. And I must say that we are going into these elections, I personally feeling very comfortable about this man who is a man of integrity, who has assured all the observer teams that they are prepared, they have explained to us what they have put in place to make sure that the whole process is transparent. But we also had an opportunity to speak with the president of the Court of Appeal. In most countries you find that when there are disputes after elections, people will go to court to raise those concerns and the case will last three years in, during which period the person who may not have won stays in office. Here in Nigeria, one thing that we have discovered is that uh, they have put in place, they were ensured that there's a time limit during which a case can be heard. We were also impressed with the enthusiasm of young people. Uh, we've been to many, many uh, situation rooms and uh, we've listened to the young people. They are eager to take their destiny to their own hands. And uh, what impresses me most is the fact that they are seriously engaged and they are prepared to make sure that every vote counts. Um, we can only stand with and by the people of Nigeria. At the end of the day, the decision should be theirs to choose a leader of their choice. Very well said, ma'am. Let me bring in Idayat Hassan, now Center for Democracy and Development. Uh, Idayat, how excited are you? Are you as excited as Her Excellency is about preparations towards the elections? Uh, and uh, you talk about four issues that will actually drive uh, these elections. Let's talk about that and what they mean uh, for Nigeria's democracy. Oh, we are very excited that this election is happening. And the excitement is also born out of the desire of Nigerians to again go to the uh, polls and elect new leaders. But importantly, actors are involved in these elections. Just right in your studio, you saw the Nigeria Communication Commission also coming up to say they do have plans for these elections. I think this is fantastic. Now, coming to our own projection for the elections, we put it as what we call the five eyes that we believe will determine these elections. And one is identity, the first I is identity, insecurity, institutions, information, and inter-party and intra-party politics as very important factors that will define the elections. And I think identity is one of the most, uh, the key factors that will define these elections. And for us, defining identity is in three prism. One, 
is the ethnic identity, religious identity, and generational identity. And you find in these elections that everybody is actually excited by the role the young people would be playing in these elections. The fact that they constitute 7 million out of the over 9 million new registered voters. But we also highlight that these young voters are not are monoliths, like they are heterogeneous. So while some are obedient, some are supporting Kwakwansi, some are Kwakwansiya, some are batified, articulated, and some are even supporting uh, Showere, which is something we should bear in mind that all young people will not vote in the same way in these elections. It's important we start highlighting this. And when it comes to ethnicity, it's really driving our elections. On one hand, where we come from, how we come, how we vote, but also importantly that since 1999, rotational presidency has also been a way of managing peace in this country, or what do you call inclusion, is a means of including people. And I think all these are actually being jettisoned as we moved into these elections. Why religion is actually a very important part, uh, factor. The Muslim to Muslim ticket, also governizing, utilizing the church, are very important and it has made strong st uh, choices for us that the day after when the results are actually being pronounced, we would actually be looking and thinking of what we are getting, if it will be another, um, uh, maybe I prefer not to talk about that, but the options are staring us in the face and telling us that there is a need for us to eat the ground running and move more in terms of national cohesion and integrity. But that is only one eye. I don't know, maybe if I can go on and talk about the other highs, which are very important. Well, let, let, let's uh, quickly bring in uh, uh, former President Banda here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, specifically, uh, Idayat spoke about inclusion. Uh, did you get the spirit of inclusion in terms of messaging to the Nigerian electorate when you went around? Yes, I've, been, I've had the opportunity to go to uh, situation rooms. I know that people with disability are also taking part in this election and, the, and the, uh, forcing their way to the table and insisting that they do need to be counted. Uh, we have we were we had the privilege to attend the signing of the peace accord, but at the end of the day, it what what actually happens, what matters, because we can make all promises, we can make uh, we can talk to the young people, but for me, our concern is what must happen. There is no way we are going to sit back and just watch people kill one another. And I think when it comes to loss of life, then I think some of us. Even when we are on the margins, watching and supporting Nigerians, we shall call it out and uh, condemn uh, violence uh, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the highest degree. The problem that I'm having is that uh, there's no way of knowing that our leaders who have signed the peace accord uh -huh. will stand by their peace accord and ensure that uh, there's no loss of life. So my, my appeal would just be that we have a peaceful elections, that every Nigerian has the right to go and vote, and that they should not be hiding in the house to fearing for their life because they are those that want to uh, inflict pain on, on them unnecessarily. So for me, yeah. we are hoping that these elections will be peaceful. Why? Because Nigeria matters on the continent. We look upon Nigeria as our champion. And the, some of us, I was the president of a whole country. And the, 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 my country was the on, only the size of Lagos alone. So we do realize that this is a mammoth task. It's not a joke. So therefore, we can only pray that we have peaceful elections. But it is incumbent upon those that have taken oath and signed a peace accord that they will uh, make sure that there's no loss of life. And they can say, it wasn't me, it was my supporters. No, but you as a leader can ensure that you are, you, your people are observing peace. Uh, absolutely. And Idayat, how concerned are you about post-election violence? Because, I mean, just like uh, many observers have pointed out, it is a very, very serious issue. Uh, what needs to happen to ensure that post-election violence is minimized to the barest, uh, you know, barest, yeah? I think one is we go back to the commitment to the peace accord, really. Officials should know that the legitimacy of their win 
is dependent on the process itself. So if you win at the end of the day and it's actually blighted with blood, what kind of win does that mean? It even means that at the end of the day, you have like one year trying to balance things. There must be a Nigeria before anybody can actually be the president of Nigeria. They, we have to get our political um, our candidates, the candidate vying in these elections to have this in mind and know that only one person will win. I think it's also important that while we are doing that and focusing, law enforcement will be key and important in these elections itself. This, they just have to be out there knowing that we, there are likelihood of post-election um, violence. And messaging becomes extremely important. And this messaging it will have to start from the fact that elections is actually a stakeholder's affair. It's not just about the Independent National Electoral Commission that is conducting these elections. It includes us as citizens who must show up and who must keep peace. And our leaders who are important, and we have seen them, even polls have revealed it, aside from the sociology of our country that are traditional and religious institutions are one of the most powerful institutions. And we are looking up to them to ensure that law and order remains in different parts of Nigeria so that Nigeria can continue to exist post these elections. We've done it before, and I'm very optimistic that we will do it once again. Uh, absolutely. I mean, let me come to you, uh, Madam, former president. I mean, you took over power in 2014 as the second female... 2012. 2012, yes. As second female uh, president in Africa. At a time when your country was going through very, very turbulent social, political and economic uh, challenges. How were you able to wade through that and what lessons can Nigeria glean from that? Yeah, Ni Ni Nigeria is the one that provides lessons for, for Africa. I mean, this is a country where a president has actually picked up the phone before even the Electoral Commission announces the elections and concede. This country is a shining example on the continent of Africa. But in my case, uh, what we must realize is that our country is bigger than us. So at the end of the day, when you get into office, there will be those animosities, hatred, people fighting, what I did is to realize that uh, there will only be any development, th there will only be any peace, there will only be any prosperity when I bring all factions of our society together. And uh, so I think it's the woman in me that w w even at the time when the president died, there was so much pain in the country. The economy had collapsed. There was no fuel for a day. There was no food for two million people. There was, the economy had grown by only 1.2 percent. It is now up to you to make sure that there's no fuel for a day, but I have a country to learn, and what is it that I must do? And the, 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 the attributes of a good leader, in my opinion, is one that is able to put together a good team, regardless of their political affiliations. For the sake of your country, bring all, those, all, all that, all that uh, human resource together, all those brands together, and think about your country first. And for me, you either get into leadership for the power or you, you get into leadership to serve. And when you get into leadership to serve, it doesn't matter how long you stay there. It is the people you must serve because at the end of the day, there's, there's life beyond state house. And uh, Joyce Banda, quickly here before uh, we round off, uh, in 2021, the continent saw the election in Zambia of Akainda Hichilema and 2022, uh, William Ruto. Now it is Nigeria. Uh, I go back to where Ungozi left off. What are the lessons? Uh, uh, because every time anyone thinks uh, there's going to be a breakdown of law and order, Africa, these countries have bounced back. What should Nigeria look forward to after this election? Yeah, what, 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 what uh, Nigeria should look forward to. I think it starts with our leaders who have signed the peace accord to say that I, I have not won. Ex-president has won, now is in charge. I must concede. I must accept the results. I must therefore stretch my hand and work together with this president. When that doesn't happen, then there's chaos. So you saw in Zambia how President Edgar Lungu very quickly mm. Uh, considered defeat, although in the, in the area he wasn't, he didn't understand, but in the end he realized, I m for the sake of Zambia, Zambia is bigger than me, so whether I have issues or not, I must concede. I did the same. 
And uh, so we found that uh, even in Kenya, when they went all the way to high court, at the end of the day, one was able to prevail and take off. So what I I I Nigerians must wait for, must, must decide, I'm talking about now our mm -hmm. 18 candidates, is to say that out of us as 18 candidates, it is one that will win. And when that one wins, the best we can do for our country, because Nigeria is our country too, mm. is for the rest of us to rally around that leader and support him for the sake of the 230 million Nigerians. Absolutely. Um, Idayat, there's this uh, spectre that continues to hang over our democratic process, something that's come to be known as vote buying. Uh, only today we read, you know, <laughs> everywhere that the EFCC intercepted 32.4 million allegedly meant for vote buying. And another House of Reps member in River State was, uh, you know, apprehended with almost uh, $500,000. In spite of the Naira crunch, it, it seems vote buying has come, you know, to stay in our uh, political trajectory. I think it's interesting. The more our, uh, our elections improves, the more the political actors find a way of circumverting the process. And I think in these elections, uh, maybe votes might actually be cheaper or much more expensive. It's also saying something about elections. I think Beavers is actually the beginning of wisdom inclusive of the IREV. And this are, is driving politicians to look for different ways of winning, knowing that ballot box stuffing is now a thing of the past. So we expect to see that, but we also expect to see that our law enforcement agencies, our anti-corruption agencies are up to the task, as we've seen in Lagos today, Rivers um, today as well. We hope to see more of that and for citizens to also know that votes do have consequences. Selling their vote for 5,000, as we keep saying, is just the word of four naira which cannot even buy a suite, like just one suite currently in Nigeria. We have to demystify that, and we have to be citizens of this great nation who wants development for our country. Mm. Uh, Your Excellency, the issue of vote buying, how much of a concern is that for you? And is it something that you would experience in your country? What no, do you think uh, is responsible for that? I, 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 vote buying, I don't know about vote buying. <laughs> this is something that I've heard in Nigeria. And ah. that, uh, if it is a concern here, I truly believe that our law enforcement officers are going to be on the lookout. But I mean, where I come from, I don't think anybody would dare to buy votes. But, uh, at, but that's a very small country. I mean, if it is just the size of uh, Lagos, then it is very easy for people to, to, to check that and to police that. But uh, here, I'm hoping that uh, this election, what we have discovered is that this country has made a lot of efforts to make sure that they have built institutions, strong institutions, improved upon the old ways, the processes. And therefore, we should have credible elections. And I think tomorrow people, even those that want to buy votes, will be disappointed. There's no better way to live it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Malawian, former president, second female president in Africa, uh, Joyce Banda. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, Hidayat Hassan, uh, executive director, Center for Democracy and Development. <laughs>